Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile. Thank you for having me here. We will have a webinar called How to Create a Coaching Culture. And my name is Angelo Lopez. I'm originated from Athens, Greece, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. So we will have, um, we'll try to uh, gather as, as many information as we can about the subject, which is how to create a coaching culture. And I would like to start off with a quote from uh, answering the question, so why is culture so important? The quote is, culture is strategy for breakfast. This is a phrase originated by Peter Drucker, and it's may been made famous by Mark Fields, president at Ford Motors, which is an absolute reality. Any company disconnecting the two are putting the success at risk. However, while many studies show there is a direct correlation between a healthy, productive culture and a company's bottom line, the majority of companies spend little time thinking, let alone doing anything about it. This topic, even when they're spending lots of time thinking about their business strategy. So why is coaching culture important? This comes from a survey of the ILM, the Institute of Leadership and Management, which shows us 80% of organizations are used, have used, or are in present using coaching. And 96% saw benefits to individuals, while 95% saw benefits to the organization itself. So how these two work together? Starting with mission, vision, and values, Let's say A for strategy, which is the guiding path through goals, objectives, and activities produce results, while let's say B, culture, which is a driving path through values, practices, and behaviors produce results. What keeps employees happy? Based on a survey of workers in 1999, which revealed the key elements that leads to employee satisfaction. This survey tells us that 28% of the employees are happy because of praise and recognition, 28% because of compensation and benefits, 6%, only 6% for job security, only 1% did not answer or do not know, a small 4% for promotions, and a big 33% for work environment. So what brought coaching in? Let's hear it from an HR manager of a large corporation. Well, she says, the coaching initiative was driven mostly because the organization wanted to develop better communication. Prior to coaching, it was more of a traditional manager-employee relationship where a manager tells the employees the things they need to do and the employee tries to do them. But we were not necessarily getting the results we were looking for. So what we are looking for are the results which can be brought by coaching. So just to hit the spot is the steps necessary to create a coaching culture. And let's just start off right now with step number one, develop the external coach provision. In the beginning, there are external coach providers involved in the company, then the coaching approach is hired and it is then used on an annual basis. This also means that the internal coaching capacity has developed both from within, with the use of the external coaches, and with the coach training. Step two, develop internal coaching capacity. It is clear that the leaders and even team members have developed a coach capacity the capacity to coach. Step three, leaders actively support coaching endeavors. Leaders have a clear coaching approach in the leadership and the coaching behaviors are an important part of the culture at the company. So important, so important that traditional leaders are not being hired by the company. Step four, develop team coaching and organizational learning. It is clear that team coaching and organizational learning is occurring even on a daily basis. Like, for example, 
daily steering committee meetings and systematically through weekly improvement meetings. This has also been observed uh, as the team members coach each other. As a step five, we'll look at how embedded is the coaching culture in the HR and the performance management process and how is that embedded on a broad scale. Step six is about coaching becomes the dominant style of managing. When coaching is officially part of formulated values, policies, and the leadership strategy, it is clearly the dominant leadership style. Number seven, the coaching becomes how we do business with all our stakeholders. The company is consistent in having a coaching approach in conversations and in communications. These are the basic seven steps for the coaching culture. An additional three has been offered here. And these are create insights of co-workers' competence and motivation, build up management acceptance and commitment, and create involvement in planning and implementation of involved parties. The step that is possibly the most important prerequisite is step eight, the insights that occurred before the change was initiated and are likely to be different from different companies. These insights are now part of the basic assumptions such as people doing the job know best how to improve it and involvement and participation creates engagement. Now moving on, let's hear for the coaching themes based on a survey conducted by ICF, the International Coach Federation. Uh, we'll take a look at coaching themes per level. Levels are entry level, mid level, senior level and high potentials and the themes that are being offered are performance management, self-esteem and self-confidence, work-life balance, career opportunities, communication skills, relationship building, and team effectiveness. So we see here in this table that what is being usually offered, I mean uh, performance management is usually being offered mainly on entry level and mid-level, while self-esteem and self-confidence impressively have been offered mainly in high potentials, followed by entry level. And work-life balance, mainly on senior, mid-level and high potentials, while career opportunities are offered mainly in high potentials. Communication skills again on senior level followed by mid-level. Relationship building mainly on senior level followed by high potentials. And team effectiveness is being mainly offered in mid-level and senior level. So we know what are crucial, what are critical, which, is, which themes are essential per level. Now the next question is about internal or external coaches and when. As you can see in this chart, the blue bars are for external coaches and the orange bars are for internal coaches while the gray bars are for managers and leaders that are using coaching skills. So we can see uh, the, the more effective per theme are um, when we discuss knowledge of company culture. Uh, best performance is being done by internal coaches followed by managers and leaders. And development of coaching culture by managers followed by internal coaches. Knowledge of company personnel and operations by managers and leaders, shortly followed by internal coaches. And pre-existing trust with employees, well, of course, yes, as expected, managers and leaders, followed by internal coaches. The ability, the accessible resource of the organization is performed mainly by internal coaches, followed by managers and leaders, and the alignment with company agenda by both internal coaches and managers leaders. The frequency of coaching by managers, knowledge of company politics by internal coaches followed by managers, cost 
by internal coaches. The ability to coach teams is better performed by external coaches, followed by managers and leaders. And the exposure to the entire workforce is better performed by managers and leaders, followed by internal coaches. Focusing on role clarity, this is best performed by external coaches, followed by managers. The level of coach training and experience is better performed by external coaches, maintaining confidentiality, of course, by external coaches, and the ability to coach executives is best performed by external coaches. Now, making and distinguishing internal coach practitioners from managers and leaders using, using coaching skills, well, we can see that one of the biggest areas of confusion when it comes to coaching is the difference between internal coach practitioners and managers slash leaders using coaching skills. This survey found that 68% of respondents agree that there is a clear distinction between the two modalities. When asked how are managers, leaders, using coaching skills distinguished from internal coach practitioners, several themes emerged that address the strengths and limitations of both modalities. The differences in the context to which coaching is applied. The fundamental difference lies at the scope of the coaching process. The managers or leaders who are able to apply coaching skills on the day-to-day -day work might be using the same techniques as an internal coach. The internal coach practitioner generally works with a variety of clients who chose a formal or an informal coaching setting to work on specific issues and sometimes could involve the manager as well or teams in their entirety. A manager or leader would use similar techniques with the intention to foster appropriate communication within the team, drive results and fulfill the team's potential as part of the normal functioning of the team rather than providing support on individual matters or to address specific team needs that require the intervention of an external independent facilitator. They are distinguished by the coaching context. Managers and leaders do coaching for their staff as part of their career development. Internal coach practitioners do coaching to achieve specific organizational outcomes. Mentoring and coaching and a distinct difference. Here's another important factor in developing an effective organizational coaching culture is to help employees understand the difference between coaching and mentoring. While formal mentoring is not a substitute for coaching, informal mentoring is often used as a supplement to coaching. Many people understand that this distinction, this distinction with the majority agreeing that mentoring whether formal or informal, should be seen as a supplement to rather than a substitute for coaching. A mentor is someone in the company who has the experience that the mentee desires, been there and done that. The job of the mentor is to equip the mentee with that information and translate their experience for them. Coaching is different and it can be helpful in the process. If a mentor has a coach approach, then it is more likely to be a mutual learning experience that is interactive because the young leader has experience that can be of equal value. If the mentor doesn't know how to tap into that, then all the mentor can do is share what worked for them, but may or may not work for the new person. Good mentors do that intuitively, but coaching skills equip them to be more effective. So we see here that even good mentors need specific training to be more effective. And this chart proves what we have just said that in uh, informal mentoring is being done by 64% more than substitute for coaching and in formal mentoring uh, Again, supplement for coaching is 41%, which is much higher than substitute for coaching, which is only a small 15%.
about training coaches. Who decides when and who to train, regardless of the organization's size, its geographical location or its industry. Human resources by 74% and learning and development, L&D, by 48% and also senior executives by 48% are responsible for identifying and selecting the coach practitioners. And this is according to an AMA sur survey and the coach selection is not necessarily determined by practitioners coaching certificates or credentials. This is very interesting. Although, as I say, it's research regarding organizational coaching has shown Many decision makers treat professional credentials as a bonus, secondary to other factors, including referrals, recommendations, and experience. It is believed by some that providing a coaching community of practice could support the ongoing development of internal coach practitioners and managers using coaching skills. A number of benefits of the community of practice will include supporting coach practitioners and managers slash leaders using coaching skills in training and education. Second, offering guidance about tools and assessments. Third, allowing an opportunity to partner with HR for development and feedback. And four, helping clarify roles within an organization. Now, what is the amount of training that is needed as you can see here in this chart, again from a survey of ICF, International Coach Federation, usually uh, managers and leaders that are using coaching skills have a coach training process which is less than 30 hours, while internal coaches usually have uh, coach training which is something between 30 and 60 hours while external coaches have um, training which is more than 60 hours and it's really very interesting to say here that as far as the major coaching associations are concerned like ICF for example, uh, the minimum of a coach training program to be approved and credited is 60 hours. So you see uh, what is important to what and how sure can you be if you want to um, employ to assign someone as an external coach uh, to coach or bring coaching or enable coaching culture in your organization that they have a better understanding, a better uh, practice and uh, consequently a better effect in what they do. Now, how do managers and leaders that use coaching skills differ from the way that traditional management was presented in the years past? Well, the focus is on employee development. It is less about supervising or managing the employees than developing the strengths, overcoming weaknesses, and creating a stronger overall person. Facilitating and challenging the thinking process of individuals to try change. Management training focuses on managing and leading a team. However, managers who coach develop individuals who are enablers, who are, sorry, enablers rather than solution seekers. They also emphasize <coughs> excuse me, on soft skills. The relationship with a direct manager now furnishes the foundation for the coaching perspective. Uses a more collaborative approach. Utilization of coaching skills supports a much more collaborative style of leadership and the directive styles and therefore training of the past. 
shift from a command and control mentality to teamwork slash collaborative slash teaching mentality. Offers a different format focus, more interactive, specific targeted coaching behaviors practiced and followed up on pulse training. It focuses on behaviors and outcomes, not information sharing and technical knowledge. It develops a coaching culture. Coaching skills are more about culture, not results, because they focus on developing correct behaviors that lead to both results and professional satisfaction. Traditional management training allowed a broader acceptance of the approach toward reports. I believe in the past coaching was more transactional, but now companies are moving toward seeing coaching as transformational. So what do we do when we try to evaluate a coaching program when we need, we need really need to evaluate a coaching program. Organizations with a strong coaching culture in place benefit from increased engagement among employees and stronger business performance. But several critical barriers exist to successfully implementing a coaching culture. And even through more organizations recognize the importance of coaching, budget plans are not keeping a pace. In addition, a large number of organizations are not evaluating the effectiveness of their coaching programs, and those that are often use anecdotal evidence instead of return on investment, ROI, and return on expectations, ROE data. Let's focus, let's discuss on the barriers. Which are the barriers to implement a coaching culture? When asked about the greatest barriers to developing a coaching culture, the top three extreme barriers to emerge are a lack of time, the limited ability to measure the ROI and ROE of coaching, and the lack of funding. The old perception of coaching as a remedial activity has shifted, and coaching is now perceived as a badge of honor by employees. Training and education is a moderate barrier. In emerging markets in particular, the lack of credentials and certifications among coaches is an even bigger barrier. Now, in this chart, which is based on the survey by NCF, you can see on the red and light blue barriers, which are considered extreme or moderate barriers, and then the orange and the dark blue, it's somewhat of a barrier or not a barrier. So we can see, we can easily uh, allocate that time is being considered a barrier, measuring ROI and ROE also, and money, as we have just said. Now, let's look at all the other factors. Time coaching to the business strategy, major barrier, compensation not tied to coaching for managers also, also a lot of accountability, uh, also perception that coaching is a remedial activity is at 50%, training and education is more than that, unclear expectations is only 50%, less than 50 is senior leader support, or building trust, or finding qualified coach coaches. According to an ICF survey, most organizations are not using sophisticated methods to evaluate the effectiveness of coaching. In fact, 27% of organizations reported they did not evaluate its effectiveness at all. For those organizations that do evaluate coaching effectiveness, the most popular measures utilized are employee feedback at a percentage of 58%. Coach feedback, 42%, and performance appraisals by 32%. Some organizations are using ROE and ROI to evaluate coaching, but to a lesser degree. In particular, 24 and 11% respectively. As research found that coaching can deliver an ROI of seven times the value invested by an organization. 
Now let's see what else. Which are the benefits of the protein culture? Again, dark blue, orange, are for those who strongly agree or just agree. Um, gray are those who neither agree nor disagree. And light blue and red are for those who disagree or strongly disagree. So the is what's really happening and which are the coaching culture benefits. Firstly, let's say it's the increased engagement and then faster onboarding on new roles. Also, rich development, the increased emotional intelligence for employees, the improved team functioning, the increased commitment, the increased job satisfaction, and the improved employee relations. <coughs> also, the improved customer service and the higher success rate for change management, the faster organization of boarding, and the increased productivity, also increased employee well-being. Well, this, this third chart is um, for uh, something which is being considered as not that much benefit does not really benefit the coaching culture of those parameters. And we are talking here about smoother transitions from merchants and acquisitions, uh, improved product launch, reduced turnover, increased time management, decreased stress, and cost reduction. Now, establish organization support. Position coaching as an invaluable initiative by identifying a respected leader to act as its champion. Give managers and leaders the tools, the information and the guidance they need to explain coaching and its value to employees. Use a variety of modalities. External coach practitioners often come with more experience but could at times, lack in depth knowledge of the company's culture, while internal coach practitioners and managers slash leaders using coaching skills often have less coach training and coaching experience, but have a better understanding of the organizational system. Companies benefit most when a combination of modalities is employed. Offer coaching for everyone. Coaching should be provided across all levels of an organization to individuals of all ages and experience levels. Deliver coaching regularly. With a variety of modalities in use, coaching can and should be accomplished at regular intervals. Managers and leaders that are using coaching skills can really engage with employees on a daily basis while internal and external coaches can interact daily, weekly, or monthly with a coachee as the situation dictates. And also clearly defined roles for each modality. The role should be clearly defined, especially between managers, leaders, and internal coaches, and those of the external coaches. Finding and training coaches. First thing to do is set up managers for success. Empower managers and leaders with training and peer coaching to help develop better coaching skills. Relationship building and soft skills such as empathy should be emphasized and opportunities for accredited coach training should be made available. Provide training. Establish a training track that allows for internal coach practitioners and managers and leaders to participate in continuous coaching education. This is very well established by both major coaching associations across the world. And um, ITF in particular names this uh, as it was be referred to here, Continuous Coaching Education, CCP, while the European Men 
which from the Coaching Council, the EUCC, uh, is referring to this as uh, CPD, which is Continuous Professional Development. Now, according to half of the respondents of the survey conducted by ICF, the ideal number of coach training hours for managers and leaders would be between 30 and 60 hours, which is um, scaling up what we have seen in the chart uh, some slides before. Uh, what we should also be focusing on is how to establish a community of practice. One way to support the development of managers and leaders and internal coach practitioners is by creating a coaching community that provides training, guidance and opportunities to explore innovative practices. This group can also strengthen the partnership with HR and foster an environment of continuous development and feedback. It is uh, very interesting to say that in some large corporations that do have a coaching culture, uh, apart from the credentials that have been that are being offered from uh, major coaching associations like ICF or ENC, they have uh, their own system of credentialing the coaches are coached with their own brand. For example, for PepsiCo, a PepsiCo coach 